Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from lunch and uh, bringing your fully revised uh, bodies and persons. Welcome. Let's slightly close this, but not in the way. We've got the most provocative title of the um, entire <coughs> program. <laughs> Let's talk about ellipse, ellipse, ellipse now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about sex, baby. <clears throat> I'm Habiba Badarun, and I'm very honored uh, to be able to introduce this panel of four speakers. I'm going to just say their names and their papers just before they speak, otherwise I think we'll forget them. So um, our first speaker will be Jenny Dupria, who will talk on rediscovering the erotic as ordinary in selected South African short stories. And uh, heads up to all the panel members, we have 15 minutes, and I'll, I'll give you a five, one, and time's up. And I'll try to be as strict as possible. So. Over to you. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Um, I'll just go straight into my paper, um, since we don't have much time. <clears throat> Mukosa Zanantaba's short story, Inside, might be labelled erotica. It can be found in the first South African anthology in any language dedicated to the erotic and contributed to only by women writers. And it's called Open, an erotic anthology by South African women writers. However, the story features no sex scenes, which is often, obviously, what's um, considered the feature of erotica. Rather, it is a narrative of the mundane, detailing Bakiwe's first visit to Zordo's apartment. The story begins with Bekiwe picking out suitable flowers as a gift for such a visit, before flashing back to how the two women met at a parents' meeting at the school Bekiwe's much younger brother attends, where Zodo is a teacher. The story details their few subsequent encounters, at the last of which Zodo gives Bekiwe some poems of hers to read. It is for the purpose of returning these poems that Bekiwe goes to Zodo's apartment for the first time. Sodwa invites her in, and they share some conversation. Sodwa takes a shower while Bakiwe listens to a jazz CD, and then Zodwa makes some breakfast. However, bet- underneath this sort of very mundane like narrative, the erotic attraction between the two women grows subtly, and ends ambivalently, ambivalently as Bakiwe leaves the apartment with the sensation of Sodwa's gaze on her. The story thus ends on a moment that is full of erotic possibilities. The definition of erotic, of course, has to do more with arousal than with the sex act per se, although obviously sex can be an erotic experience. However, Harbour's own explanation that in Inside she was deliberate about needing to write an erotic story where there is no sex because sex is not necessarily the only thing that makes an encounter erotic points to a general tendency to conflate erotic and sex, or the sex act. While this conflation might seem harmless enough, Audrey Lord's discussion in her influential essay, Uses of the Erotic, the Erotic as Power, suggests otherwise. This essay is Lord's contribution to the feminist pornography debate of the so-called sex wars that took place in America. It remains relevant today and is frequently used in African feminist discussions of sex, sexual pleasure and the erotic. Lord critiques what she sees as the misnaming of the erotic by men and its use against women. She argues that the erotic is confused with the pornographic, which emphasizes sensation without feeling. Lord's essay uh, works to reclaim the erotic from such misogynistic manipulations by expanding the scope of the erotic, um, or how we understand the erotic, beyond sex into the realm of true feeling, as well as political, creative, and everyday activities. Following Lord, Harbour's attempt to remind her readers about the broader scope of the erotic might be seen as a distinctly feminist project. Her focus on the mundane details of the two women's encounters, such as the moments of awkwardness, the small talk they engage in, the detail of an uncomfortable stool in the kitchen, speaks to the link Lord makes between the erotic and the everyday. To borrow a phrase from Jabulo and Nebele, Haba might be seen to, to be working towards rediscovering the ordinary erotic. Nebele famously coined the phrase the rediscovery, rediscovery of the ordinary in the title of his... Um, essay, critiquing what he saw as the spectacular tendencies of South African protest literature. He critiques this literature for being too focused on exteriority, on people as signs or symbols of inequality and oppression, and calls instead for a rediscovery of the ordinary, a turn towards depth, interiority, and a focus on detail. Alain de Bele's use of the terms spectacular and ordinary are quite specific to his subject. They might usefully, or at least I'll propose that it can be, usefully repurposed for discussion of the representation of sex and the erotic. 
Representation of sex is often subject to a spectacular treatment, especially when it is meant to arouse or titillate. The focus becomes on the exterior, reducing the erotic to the mechanistic movement of bodies. The interior experience of sex, which includes both the sensual and emotional aspects of the experience, are lost, often lost from view. Of course, historically, women have been particularly subject to this spectacularization, their desires and pleasures stripped away in the process of sexual objectification. And in the African context, the intersection of race and gender adds another layer to this objectification as colonial discourse constructed images of black women as hypersexual without capacity for sensual erotic experience. So uh, if you use Lord's terminology, we could see colonial representation of black female sexuality as implicitly pornographic, or even explicitly so. Harbour's approach to the erotic and inside can be seen to write back against the spectacular history of the representation of black female sexuality, as well as responding to the spectacular depiction of lesbian women both in pornography and the South African public imaginary. In pornography, women having sex with women has often been framed for the male gaze, with women becoming props in a male fantasy. In South Africa, depictions of lesbian women are also circumscribed by a dominant narrative of victimhood. As Stephanie Selvig points out, in a country where gender-based violence and corrective or curative rape is so rife, sensationalist news headlines about violated and traumatized lesbians can easily become the dominant spectacular narrative. So it links very much back to what Shelley Barry was talking about um, in her conversation. Um, so one way to perhaps de rediscover the ordinary of the erotic could be to focus on the interior lives and desires of characters, um, offering intimate knowledge and describing those details that refuse reduction to stereotype, as I'll argue Haber does. Speaking of inside, Haber explains, I wanted to explore other and nuanced layers and ways of writing the erotic within a same-sex couple. A reader once told me of how irritated they were when they first read Inside, because nothing happens in the story. It was upon the third rereading that they got it, and suddenly so much was happening. This feedback affirms my intentions. The reader's account here suggests that Haber has been successful in exploring other ways of writing the erotic. Her narrative is not immediately legible to the reader, who is perhaps used to spectacular depictions of the erotic that rely on easily understood cliches and explicit sex scenes. The mundanity of the story, the appearance that nothing is happening, means that the reader has to learn a new way of reading through continued engagement. By layering the erotic underneath the mundane, Haber interrupts an easy reading process which might simply enforce narrow understandings of the erotic, especially with regards to female same-sex sexuality. The reader cannot hypersexualize, objectify or other the female erotic experience depicted in the text because it is woven into the mundane and thus the familiar. And yet the story does not de-eroticize the erotic or the female same-sex sexuality as the erotic is the most essential element of the narrative. I would like to suggest that Inside's rediscovery of the ordinary reflects the general sensibility of the collection in which it appears, um, almost like a quintessential um, example in a way. While many of the other stories contain explicit sex scenes, they also tend to place a focus on the inner lives of their characters and work against stereotypical depictions of the erotic. Open arguably rediscovers the ordinary erotic in multiple ways, sometimes by re revealing the ordinary beneath the apparently spectacular. In order to explore this further, I turn to a story that shares many elements with Inside. It also focuses on sexual desire between two women during the initial phase of attraction, without depicting any sex between them. Uh, the story is Mrs. Habib's Hypothalamus by Susie Bell, which depicts the everyday life of its eponymous character as animated by the erotic. It follows Mrs. Habib, who lives in the Burkhop as she goes about her day, all the while haunted by sexual desire in the form of her throbbing hypothalamus of the title. The narrative opens with Mrs. Habib's morning routine, sketches some of the textures of her life, and then, in a flashback, reveals the catalyst for her throbbing hypothalamus, a meeting with Miss Duval, a bookshop assistant, with whom she shared an intense conversation about literature. Like in Inside, the story ends with only the potential of um, the consummation of the erotic charge between the characters. Like Inside, Bell's story does not have a particularly strong plotline, focusing instead on the ordinary details of the life of its protagonist. However, while the details of Bakiwe's life appear mundane due to their matter of fact narration, Mrs. Habib's everyday life appears far from mundane. Rather, as I will show, this ordinary life is animated by the erotic. 
uses of the erotic, Lord observes that women have been taught to separate the erotic demand from most vital areas of their lives other than sex, and calls for this lesson to be unlearned. For Lord, joy and the erotic are strongly connected, as an important way in which the erotic connection functions is the open and fearless underlining of the capacity for joy. Writing far more recently than Lord, um, and in a bit of a different pers- from a different perspective, N- uh, Stacey Newmar also problematizes the reduction of eroticism to the phenomenon of se- sexual arousal. She argues for conceptualizing eroticism as an emotional experience. For Newmar, eroticism is arousal not only when it manifests in what she calls genital excitement. Rather, it is an arousal in that it marks a phenomenological change from a relative dormancy to a relative vitality. It awakens, enlivens, and spills from one phenomenological category to another. What differentiates it from other emotional arousals is that it is experienced as pleasurable. This reconceptualization of eroticism resonates with Lord's description of the erotic as a deep emotional satisfaction or enlivening force that makes work a pleasure. Mrs. Habib's life appears animated by this kind of eroticism. Each moment of Mrs. Habib's everyday routine is imbued with a kind of enlivening joy, even those aspects which to some would be discomforting or depressing. Um, For example, she finds delight in her aging body, and I'll quote from the text. She admired her fulsome nakedness, staring at every inch of herself in her full-length bedroom mirror. There was more than an inch to be explored. A moment on the lips, another inch on the hips, she tittered to herself as she fondly inspected what she did not see as deterioration, but rather a miraculous metamorphosis. (coughs) She accepted new wrinkles and sags with curious delight and astonishing glee. Mrs. Habib was proud of her soft folds of skin. They were such a familiar comfort to her, like her soft cotton pajamas, which she could never imagine living without. Mrs. Habib's everyday morning routine of caring for her body is not depicted as dull or repetitive, nor is it marked by the self-doubt that accompanies many narratives where women confront their naked bodies. Rather, Mrs. Habib finds an erotic pleasure in her own naked body, one that is marked by a sense of fondness, familiarity and comfort, suggested by the comparison to her soft cotton pyjamas. The erotic is thus depicted as an ordinary, everyday part of Mrs. Habib's life, even as it elevates that ordinariness, as can be seen in the phrase miraculous metamorphosis. The eroticism of the story, as explored through Mrs. Habib's perspective, is also marked by a richness that incorporates rather than excludes the supposedly flawed. Um, The story is full of quirky details about Mrs. Habib's life, which paints a picture of a thoroughly engaged and interested person. Uh, She's fascinated, for example, by death and taxidermy, she loves old things, and is invested in creating a sensuous experience for herself through food, scent, and literature. The story, through building this rich image of Mrs. Habib's life, um, distinctly works against a sanitized, clinical, emotionless, or purely functional mainstream kind of eroticism. The story, in fact, juxtaposes Mrs. Habib's erotic experience, both that which animates her life more generally and the more explicit sexual desire she has for most of all, with an image of the erotic experience she imagines for the bachelors in the icy, cold, chrome studio apartments she fears will overrun a gentrified worker. Mrs. Habib imagines these bachelors masturbating to images of Minky or Rosie Moutine in their golden bikinis. Seen through Mrs. Habib's eyes, this white heteronormativity appears formulaic and lifeless, in contrast to the queer eroticism that enlivens her world and her relationship with her body. The perfection of the models is highlighted as an empty signifier, one that is empty of eroticism and capable of providing, to use Lord's words, only plasticized sensation and no true feeling. Both Inside and Mrs. Habib's hypothalamus extend the domain of the erotic beyond sex and sexual arousal into the realm of the ordinary and everyday. This is not to say that they diminish the importance of sex in the lives of the women they depict. In fact, they portray se- sexual desire as a fundamental part of these women's lives, but the experience of eroticism is not limited to the sexual. In Inside, it is the mundane details of the interactions between two women that form the substance of the erotic and erotic experience emerges as another moment in ordinary life. Subtly, however, the power of the erotic as an enlivening force is revealed as it catalyzes a journey inside for Bikiwe. In Mrs. Habib's hypothalamus, the eponymous character's everyday life is more overtly marked by the erotic. Eroticism transforms the ordinary as it enlivens the potentially mundane. In different ways, then, these stories work to expand the ways we think about the erotic, specifically by foregrounding how we might imagine the erotic as embedded in ordinary everyday life. To end with a quote from Karen... I don't know how you say his last name, Shimk, 
writing about the stories in open. These stories open a vista on the subtleties of arousal, the frank spectacle of the different forms of life, of sex in women's lives, the presentation of intimacy as both deeply mundane and vividly transformative. Thank you, Jenny. Beautifully timed. Um, <laughs> our next speaker is Kevin Bostar, who will speak on Silent No More, Voicing Queerness in African Short Fiction. Over to you. Um, I would just like to preface this paper with an invitation to heavily critique this work. It is part of my master's thesis, and so it is a living idea and I would also just like to preface it in that way just to let you know that it's not in any way or shape finalized so I would in appreciate critiques that are harsh in a way <laughs> okay I would also like to open up with a really lovely quote that I feel captures the spirit of the argument I'm trying to make it is taken from Emma Paulette's Warm which is from Queer Africa 2 the full moon kept me up as always its light infiltrated the room through the glass of the window and I grew restless you refused to close the curtains and what about the neighbors I said let them enjoy the show and then you covered my mouth with yours Heteronormative societal constructions have attempted to silence queerness that has arguably always existed throughout history and throughout most societal contexts. As a consequence of the, the, the dissemination of stifling Western conceptions of gender and sexuality stemming from colonial interventional interventions and patriarchal queerphobia, this silencing has naturally attempted to silence any form of queerness or any form of gender conception and sexuality that does not meet colonial expectations um, that might have taken place on the African continent. By drawing from recent queer short anthologies whose stories draw from Africa and its diasporas, this paper seeks to map out the various ways in which the selected so short fiction reconfigures sexuality and gender conce conce conception by breaking the silence surrounding the queer in Africa. Anthologies that forefront queer narratives from Africa illustrate the subversion of patriarchal heteronormative policing surrounding sexuality and gender conception in African contexts. Stories like Setunya Likes Girls Better by Wame Molefe, Watering the Imagination by Didier Osman and Perilous Love by Jennifer Shinte Aya Bazibwe excuse me, make known the experiences of lesbian African women and the dangers associated with acting on lesbian desire in an African context. Context. These stories explore and voice same-sex pairings that have been stifled for millennia under the crushing weight of heteronormative societal views surrounding sexual identities and pairings who do not match heteronormative societal expectations. Take a shot every time I say heteronormative. When drawn together, these stories work, <laughs> work to unsettle heteronormative, heteronormativity as they form a tapestry that voices queer experiences, which I argue is essential in voicing and disseminating queer narratives from Africa, consequentially allowing for the muted queer to finally speak in the face of heteronormativity in a chapter entitled The Homophobic Academy, taken from his over a gay men's literature in the 20th century, Mark Lilly maps out the various reasons and ways in which homosexual and also queer issues in literature have been neglected, ranging from critics who are reluctant to embarrassment combined with willful Ill ignorance. According to Lilly, there has been a reluctance in the discussion and an active avoidance to consider queerness in literary studies. And yet, with the recent influx in the publication of short story anthologies that center around queerness in Africa and the diaspora, short fiction writers are making it impossible for their narratives to go unnoticed and for their queerness to go undiscussed. The voice, um, the act of voicing one's experience, or the act of voicing a narrative that allows for a discussion of this experience, is also an act of making oneself known. Arguably, to unmute oneself for a narrative that has been systematically silenced is to declare and solidify one's experience, existence. In an article entitled Querying Examples of Contemporary South African Short Fiction, scholar Sally Ann Murray makes a link between queerness and the short story, where she argues that the short story format has had to legitimize ex it, its existence and authenticity in the literary world in the same way that queerness and queer identities have had to legitimize their existence and authenticity in a world that has posited heterosexuality as the, sexu as the sexual and gendered norm. Additionally, Murray argues that recent short fiction writers have begun to to revisit the very format of narration that has dominated the writing of the short story. Murray argues that the short story as a genre seems itself to constitute an attractive, consanguine figuration of diversely queer forms that queerness may take. 
If one considers Murray's stance on the ways in which a queer lens might alter the reading of the short of short fiction, it becomes evident that short fiction writers from the African continent are playing with and reconfiguring the ways in which short narratives are structured and delivered. This destabilization of narration then aligns with the main intention of queer thought, which is to critique anything that is oppressively normal. In the note from the editors of Queer Africa 2, Mako Sensana Kaba and um, Karen Martin explain that their intention with their anthology is to productively disrupt, through the art of literature, the potent discourses currently circulating on what it means to be African, to be queer, and to be an African creative writer. Short fiction allows for a plethora of voices to be heard when collected into an anthology, making possible for a multitude of narratives within the confines of a single anthology. Before I will analyse um, the two selected stories, which for brevity's sake are um, only two, wow, that was very articulate of me, it is necessary to critique the term queer in relation to this argument. As a term, queer becomes pertinent in the articulation of experiences that resist binary definitions. Although it might seem contradictory to make use of a label with the, when the intentions of said label is to be ambiguous and unstable, queer can be seen as a transitory mechanism which assists in the abolition of binary identity labels. As Jane Meek indicates, queer theory can encourage a critique of the binary system of gender and sexuality and the identities or mere labels defined by such rigid binary and heteronormative systems. As the term itself is only effective as a result of its instability and ambiguity. The term's instability prevents queer from becoming, a totalize, from becoming totalizing in its application, which troubles the notion of rigid binary-based identities. It is inclusive of any non-heteronormative identity classification, and it is inclusive of all, of all forms of gender and sexuality that are at odds with the heteronorms that attempt to dominate each individual experience of sexuality and gender. Although there is sometimes a theoretical and social reluctance, reluctance to use queer as an umbrella term, it is important to consider that queer theorists challenge the notion of a static, essential, and natural identity, and that they rather seek to make known the multitudes that exist in sexual and gendered conceptions of identity. In the same way, many of the authors of the selected short fiction chosen for this analysis, the two of them, through their voicing of these queer narratives that stem from Africa and its diasporas, are making known the queerness that colonial expectations and toxically masculine patriarchal systems have attempted to silence. Although the term queer and the terms that fall under its umbrella, such as gay and lesbian, could possibly be accused of being Western terminologies that do not properly encapsulate the intricacies of African sexualities that predate colonial interventions, one cannot deny that there are Africans living on the continent and in the diaspora who live using these terms in their navigations of sexuality and gender conception. And in fact, the argument could be made that queers on the African continent are usurping the Western terminology and vocabulary of queerness in order to bend and reconfigure these terminologies and vocabularies to fit their own realities and identities in the same way that the term queer was reclaimed by queer bodies from the patriarchal heteronorm. In the essay, Africa's Future Has No Space for Stupid Black Men, which is the winner of the 2018 publication, the Gerald Clark Anthology, entitled As You Like It, Pongulongi Daoud reflects on the current state of Nigerian of the current Ni- of the Nigerian queer community, excuse me, and the danger that the queer Nigerian faces on a daily basis. Nestled within his cathartic reflection, Daoud engages with what he calls the Afro modern. Daoud's essay pivots around an under the radar queer gathering that he attended, held held on a regular basis, and that is referred to as a brainstorming session, where a group of queer Nigerians regularly facilitate discussions on issues pertinent to their current contexts. At this particular gathering, the discussion centered around the concept of the Afro-modern. According to Dawood's reflection on the evening's discussions, Afro-moderns are, n- um, <coughs> excuse me, are not Afro-romantics, and that the Afro-modern seeks to create Africa's <laughs> new curricula, politics, art and aesthetics, business, industry and plura- plur- pluralities. Daoud elaborates on this concept, further elaborates on this concept, and explains that Afro-moderns are men and women whose only family, industry, and business is Africa, and the constant pursuit is to expand, diversify, energize, imagine, and reimagine it. We are homosexuals, heterosexuals, bisexuals, transsexuals, and whatever sexuals, burning to rescue this continent from the ruins of toxic, toxically heteronormative patriarchal men. 
Dawood's reflections on what he calls the Afro-modern align slightly with what Achille Mbembe, in conversation with Sarah Balakrishnan, explains as Afropolitanism. According to Mbembe, Afropolitanism refers to an attempt to make Africa its own centre, and also that it is, an, it is an acknowledgement of the complexities that have shaped the multitudes of African identities as a result of colonial intervention without undoing or dismissing the important task of de- decolonizing Africa. Although Mbembe and Balakrishnan do not explicitly discuss sexuality and gender in their conversations, I argue that marrying Dawood's conception of the Afro-modern with Mbembe and Balakrishnan's discussion on Afropolitanism can allow for the acknowledgement that queerness in its vocabulary, such as gay or transgender, might not necessarily stem from an explicitly African pre-colonial space or lens, but that it has permeated into African conceptions and voicings of sexuality and gender. The selected short stories, for example, make use of these vocabularies, and to deny their validity as African would be to erase and silence a historically muted African body. Two Weddings for Amoa by Dilma uh, Dilmandila, published in the inaugural publi- publication of the Gerald Crock anthology entitled Pride and Prejudice, rather cheekily, engages with the traditional form of same-sex marriage called Nyumba and Tobu as a main driving force in the story's narrative. Although this practice is not intended to be sexually motivated, it has and is still practiced throughout Africa despite the taboo surrounding same-sex marriage. Two Weddings for Amoa is something of an anomaly amongst the selected short fiction in that it is a science fiction set in a dystopian Uganda where an event referred to as the Big Burn has reduced the population by half and has left disease and famine in its wake. Another consequence of the Big Burn is an incurable barrenness in women that is possibly the result of geoengineering that had been necessary to fight the Big Burn and or a reliance on chemical, on chemical, chemicals, chemical food excuse me, to fight famine. Um, I would have liked to have gone into the story in a lot more detail, but I shall, however, as I'm running out of time, talk about instead the other story I'd mentioned, as I feel it is more pertinent to my discussion. I just need to find it. There we go. Although it differs from Two Weddings for Amoir, as it is not speculative or science fiction, Diria Osman's story in Ndambi, taken from his short story anthology, Fairy Tales for Lost Children, tells the story of a woman who has been rejected by her family for being a black African Muslim lesbian. Like many of the stories from Fairy Tales for Lost Children, Ndambi is a playful exploration of contemporary queerness that positions, its, that positions its protagonist as a queer body who claims their own sexual agency in spite of the policing of heteronormative societal ideals that would discredit and dismiss their validity. In the face of this rejection, which in the narrative manifests as a phone call between Osman's protagonist, who is named Samira, but actively dismisses this name and refers to herself as Ndambi, or most beautiful in Somali, and her sister Hawa. During this tense phone call, Ndambi is playfully defiant, ending off the encounter by brushing her sister off and stating, self-preservation is what's really going on today. Later in the story, Ndambi's playfulness is peppered with a loneliness as she revisits her sexual experiences with her ex-lover Adrienne, who would melt Ndambi down until she stank of sex and satisfaction. However, Ndambi does not allow this momentary lapse into melancholic reflection to crush her playful spirit. Ndambi embodies and names, or perhaps voices herself, despite the rejection she has faced by her family and her ex-lover through a sensual masturbation that becomes a powerfully defined gesture. She explains that her queer body is a site where home is in her hair, her lips, and in her arms, solidifying the validity of her identity by attributing it to a space that is tangible. The last section of the story allows Osman, by using Ndambi's playfully defined voice, to ruminate on what it means to be free in an African, uh, in a queer body, excuse me, that has been rejected by their society. Ndambi mentions that her family, friends, colleagues, and even strangers have claimed that she is not included in the prophet's vision, and yet, despite this, she does not allow this rejection to disintegrate her sense of self. She defiantly states that she is her own home and reminds herself that it's all about that forward motion, indicating that adversity that the adversity Ndambi has faced will not stagnate her growth. Ndambi claims that in order to exist in a world, it is necess- in, in the world, it is necessary to give yourself permission on how to lead your life, naysayers be damned, since no one allows anyone anything. Ndambi's unapologetic staunchness in the face of heteronormative silencing refutes the notion that her Africanness, her religion, and her queerness are not tangible. In other words, the voicing of Ndambi's narrative is implying that if one exists in a body that allows for these intersections, one's existence cannot be refuted or denied. 
Two Weddings for Amour, which I unfortunately did not get a chance to discuss, and Ndambi both illustrate the varied ways in which queer African bodies can legitimize and voice out their identities while also being voicings of African queerness in and of themselves. In a review of Queer Africa New and Collected Fiction, Olawafeme Adeagbo indicates that the stories featured in the anthology establish same-sex intimacy and also queer realities as African, but that they also establish that what is un-African is queer phobia. Arguably, the sentence sentiment could be sentence could be draped <laughs> sentiment could be draped over any and all of the anthologies that make up the significant influx of short story anthologies that focus specifically on queer African narratives. In order to conclude this paper, I will refer to another of Osman's short stories, which captures the sentiment that this paper has attempted to articulate. In Watering the Imagination, a two-page story that serves as the opening for fairy tales of lost child for lost children, an elderly Somali woman contemplate her daughter Sildana's love for another woman. The Hoyo explains, in Somali culture many things go unsaid, how we love, who we love, and why we love that way, which is a sentiment that can arguably be said for many cultures regarding love, gender, and sexuality. She goes on further to explain that she does not know why Sultana loves the way she loves and why Sultana loves who she loves. She explains that she is letting Sultana, Sultana dream in a way that her generation was not capable of and that she is also letting Sultana reach for something that neither she nor Sultana can, can articulate. The story ends with the Hoyo saying, We will not go back, which I argue captures the spirit that all of the recent publications of queer short fiction anthologies from Africa and ruminations on the legitimacy and future of queerness on the continent are trying to articulate. Thank you. I feel almost unemployed as a chair. <laughs> <coughs> Perfect time. Uh, our next speaker is Taniko Chauke. Mm -hmm. who is right. <laughs> this is the audience I like. Uh, who is giving a paper on women's conceptualization of sexual liberation in patriarchal contexts of a democratic South Africa? Over to you, Tiko. Thank you. Um, this is a working paper from my PhD, which is currently under examination. So <coughs> I'm a nervous wreck. <laughs> Um, the study builds on the unintended outcomes of my master's research project, wherein I learned that oppressive colonialist <coughs> patriarchal constructions of gender were maintained by the men and women of the rural community in Gomazi district, located in Bumalang. The rural women <coughs> reported experiences of oppression within the Swazi tradition. However, they reported these practices as necessary to preserving the African tradition and culture. For example, Amongst these were the culturally constructed sexual roles for women, as well as traditionally constructed femininities. Anfred rightly puts it that reference to culture has become an essential condition of African women's oppression. It may therefore be argued that sexuality is utilized as a conduit of the oppression of contemporary black South African women. I argue that in the efforts to emancipate the nation, the liberation movements overlooked the liberation of women's bodies from the oppressive and patriarchal instruments of apartheid and the colonial era. In support of this statement, Lewis puts forward that the racist <coughs> legacies that fixated on the sexualities of black women have meant that black women suppress discussions about their bodies and sexuality, thus fueling further the dominant heteronormative and patriarchal public discourses. Mm -hmm. Sihalo makes the observation that people who live <coughs> through colonizations and pro and other oppressive regimes carry secret experiences that go unrecounted. Mm -hmm. Thus, the thrust of the study lies in understanding the conceptualizations of women's experiences of sexual liberation in the context of an emancipated, albeit patriarchal country. The aims of my study, well, I'll mention two because I'm, I'll be out of time soon. Um, one of the aims were to understand the manner in which elderly women represent issues of gender, sexuality, and liberation within this transition. <coughs> Secondly, to examine women's experiences of a democratic country such as South Africa through discourses on their bodies and experiences of sexuality. Thirdly, I wanted to investigate differences and similarities for elderly and young women who have been located within shifting social-political landscapes of South Africa. 
I then look at a theme um, which I named Imperial Gaze and Interference. In this section, I revisit the African history of colonial oppression and colonial constructions of sexuality, so as to point the ways in which the logics of sexuality have been disabled, enabled, or even reproduced. I then quote uh, Tamale and Aniko. I argue that the pre-colonial communities exuded liberation and emancipation. In fact, Oyewumi and Lugones concur that gender is a colonial imposition. Thus, native tribal groups and Africans were unperturbed by Western conceptions of gender and sexuality. The act of naming and ordering of humans was a primary tool in the colonial endeavor. But Kerry Yusuf surmised that the entire Western <coughs> epistem bases its category and hierarchies on visual modes and binary distinctions. Oyewumi argue that prior to colonization in Oyo Yoruba tribe in Nigeria, gender and patriarchy were never organizing principles. Oh, Lord. Okay, and then uh, Hanan, in the review of Amaidumi's work, expands how pre-colonial Nobi society, Lovedu, Venda, Zulu, and Tonga, and others possessed a flexible gender system that allowed women greater access to institutions of social political authority and the ability to expand their economic role by taking female husbands. Such roles were not rigidly masculinized or feminized, nor was stigma attached to breaking the rules. This is in contrast to the West rigid gender system where women wielding power became reclassified as men like. Ethnographic researchers have reported that African men have always had sex with one another, and the same can be said about the women. The assumption that same-sex desire among Africans is a Western disease, according to some politicians and religious entities, are in contrast. It is against this backdrop that Kendall suggests that we need to look freshly at the ways Western constructions of sexuality and homophobia are used to limit and oppress African people. And see, we point out that in all these societies, same-sex desire was not understood in the Western discourse of gay or lesbian. In light of the preceding arguments, it is therefore expected that the imperialists would be dangerously fascinated with the liberated pre-colonial bodies and sexualities. I explore Casta Semenya and Sarah Bartman as examples of the manner in which imperial fascination with black bodies has led to the need to control and police the alleged deviancy of African sexualities and bodies as they are deemed unfit to Western norms of civilization. In 2009, the IAAF officials had confirmed that 18-year-old Casta Semenya, after competing her first senior championship, was to undergo sex determination testing to confirm her eligibility to race as a woman. We all remember the dreadful images of Casta spread all over the magazine that portrayed her as gaily, feminine and soft in efforts to make her more palatable to the Western gaze. She had her makeup done, nails and a weave. So over the years, we all thought, phew, okay, that has died down. Well, not quite. It was reported earlier this year by the IFF that Casta Semenya will have to take medication to lower her testosterone levels as a result <coughs> of the new rules. The, pre the IA, oh Lord, IAAF <laughs> president <laughs> was quoted as saying, we choose to have two classifications for our competition men's events and women's events. This means we need to be clear about the competition criteria for these two categories. My next uh, theme is diseased black bodies. So in keeping with the Western notion of labeling and categorizing bodies, <coughs> the HIV and AIDS epidemic has successfully provided the Western media and a plethora of NGOs and AIDS organizations with a windfall in reviving the deep-seated colonial prejudices, myths regarding the alleged rampancy of African bodies, sexual behavior, and disease sexualities. For example, I argue that statistics produced Produced in South Africa and globally on HIV prevalence and incidence rates on are mainly centered around a certain category of uh, individuals whom by colonialist patriarchal standards are not considered normal or have no business in having sex. 
These include women who have sex with women, men who have sex with men, people with disabilities, as well as young women between the ages of 15 to 24. Now the demographics, as usual, include black people in rural areas and some semi-rural areas. Gola rightly puts it that bodies are utilized as shambox to keep women and black people from transgressing. Thus, Maldonado Torres argues that coloniality is kept alive in books, in the criteria for academic performance, as well as in the self-image of people. And I come to the methods and analysis. I utilize uh, qualitative research methods and a narrative <coughs> approach. I also drew from decolonial African feminist framework as a tool to question, deconstruct, and reimagine African sexual cultures. Mkabela reasons that research has overlooked, misinterpreted, and marginalized the value of African indigenous communities in response to the complicity <coughs> of academia in the marginalization of black African women's voices and the exploitation of black Africans for research purposes, I thus position my thesis among scholars' debates in the needs for indigenous and decolonizing methodologies. I then embarked on the collective effort ethics suggested by Mkabela of my community in the research project, <coughs> namely Ubuntu, which always stresses humanness that is characterized by generosity, love, maturity, hospitality, politeness, understanding, and humility. I further drew from Smith's uh, eight of the 25 decolonizing research projects to explore marginalized cultural knowledge, practices, and identity. The stories are drawn from narratives of 20 women Women between the ages 18 and 82 years. Of the 20, 10 were young women, also known as born freeze, between the ages 18 to 34. I utilized focus group as it provided an advantage and allowed a space for oh, the diverse generation of women to come together and create meanings of sexual liberation. In my findings, I found that young women were accused of being lustful as compared to their male peers, thus attracting negative attention, including rape. As a result, some of the young women presented disconsenting views and perceptions of their reproductive abilities and their sexuality, often as presenting a hindrance to obtaining a successful future and thus posing as self-sabotage. Authors have argued that on a daily basis, women in particular struggle with the contradictions that makes them strangers to their bodies. Therefore, I am arguing that women's bodies continue to be utilized as tools to disempower them because they pose as a threat to patriarchal male power. To advance my argument, I concede with Gasa's contention that the legacy of apartheid is being advanced through women's bodies. <laughs> she states that women's bodies are a terrain of struggle and their emancipation <coughs> remains deferred. Okay, and then <coughs> I cut out an extract from one of the focus groups with the older women to show how they use silence <coughs> uh, to sneakily... Um, transgress against patriarchy. So in the discussions they were talking about how the men are expecting them to just lie down and the man just does the job and you're not supposed to do anything because if you show agency then it proves that you are loose or you've been having sex with someone else other than your husband. So the older woman says, no, there are many ways to skin a cat. So you, you also get used to doing what pleases you. When Babe is inside of you, you know how to direct him using your body. When he turns, you give him directions to Shabalal because you know your body and what you want. You'll say, Paula, Jerusalem, Paula, Jerusalem, Mshata, Mshata. So she was imitating ta taxi marshals on how they shout destinations for passengers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the older women confronted the dominant narrative of them as caretakers. The young women articulated that elderly women are not living up to the respectable titles of Mage and Gogo. The symbolism attached to the titles includes respect, nation builder, and a dignified person who embodies wisdom. As a result, the older women were blamed for their destructive sexual bodies, as this has subsequently encouraged older men to proceed to having a date 
to date younger women. Young women were adamant that if an older woman reprimanded them on how they handled their sexual bodies, it was also their prerogative to ensure that older women stuck to the dictated code of how older women are expected to act. On the other hand, some of the elder women said it was also an act of rebellion against an oppressive system. Some of the gogos and older women s saw nothing wrong with them dating younger boys. They questioned how it could be an acceptable norm that older men were viewed as sexual beings and permitted to, to indulge in their sexual desires, while the opposite was expected of women. I gathered from the, both the group discussions and personal narratives that elderly, rom elderly women's romantic partnerships are an area that is neglected, while some of the women who desire to explore are halted by expectations in the community and culture. In addition, dignified aging for women includes a terminated sex life where elderly women are perceived to be asexual and awaiting their death. And I quote um, Musila. In conclusion, taking into account the preceding arguments, I agree with feminist <coughs> scholars that the project of Rainbow Nation and Democratized State has consistently worked to silence the oppressed and the oppressor by way of coercing South Africans to forgive and forget and also seek for peace as former President Nelson Mandela did, thereby enforcing silence of past suffering. Gola encapsulates the position of the study by highlighting that truly liberated women do not live in fear of violent intrusions into their private spaces, including their bodies. And I myself, as a woman in South Africa, and from the narratives that I gathered from the women, I do not feel safe in my own country. I have not taken up ownership of the democratic country, and I don't feel safe in South Africa, our land. Um, I then quote uh, Malcolm X, who says, when you're in your own land, you are in a position to get justice. But when you're in another man's land, another man's country, under another man's government and court system, you are going to look up to him to get justice. And you'll never get it. We need the land of our own in order to establish our own society. This is the best panel in existence. Never had to. This is a very unemployed <coughs> sign. So, uh, Timmy, I hope you won't um, break the record here. <laughs> But uh, our last speaker uh, is Olara Timi Ogumbeni, whose paper is titled Language, Female Sexuality and Gender Ideology in Chinelo Parantas Under the Udala Tree and Jude Dibia's Walking with Shadows. Over to you, Olara Timi. Would you like to sit I'll here? I'll be speaking to the topic language, female sexuality, <coughs> and gender ideology in Apparentas, Under the Udala Trees, and Judith Working with Shadows. It is important to <coughs> let you know that contemporary Nigerian novels they provide discourses on sexuality. And as such, they are a popular site for feminist analysis of social cultural messages about sexuality and gender issues in Nigerian society. And this afternoon, I'm um, here to look at how these novels, these novels, focus on how situated lessons, this language that has been situated in specific context can be used to construct gender ideologies and uh, female sexuality. And <clears throat> to also put the study in context, I would like to talk briefly about some of the concepts that are coming to the present study. And one of them is patriarchy. 
Nigerian society is heavily patriarchal in nature. <clears throat> that has to be established. And patriarchy refers, basically refers to a situation where you have power dynamics that <clears throat> puts uh, men in a position in which they dominate women. That's just the basic definition. It's a situation where men heavily dominate women. And another concept that we also be interested in is gender. Now, this study agrees with Butler, 1980-1990, that says gender is an art, a verb, that one can actually perform in a specific environment and context. It, it, it depends on the actor who is performing. The person can choose to be any gender that he or she wants to be. Then, another thing I'd like to talk about again is heteronormativity. This term is coined by one in 1993, which is the assumption that everyone is heterosexual. And <clears throat> the recognition that all social institutions are built around a heterosexual model of male-female relations. Then heteronormativity aligns with the essentialist definitions of gender and the notion that all human beings can be categorized along a male-female binary. <clears throat> Another concept that is um, important for what we're doing here is sexuality. And this refers to the feelings, behaviors, experiences, and expressions of humans as sexual beings. Yes, it is the essence, the whole of a human being. Then, for literature review, we are just saying that this study is going to be the first that will look at gender issues in novels in Nigeria. No. There have been studies that have considered gender and identity. Long Toba Uju and Long Toba Uju 2013. Ogunye Mitu 2014 is another one. Then we also have studies on sexuality, sexuality and sex. We have Okolo 2013, 2014, and Ajibari 2013. We also have studies on gender roles. We have Doga 2009. These studies, they've all agreed that women are being exploited in the Nigerian society because they are expected to function in an environment where an environment where An environment where they are heavily dominated by the men for. Now, we've said before now that studies have paid attention to gender issues in Nigerian society. But then, where are studies that focus on how contextualized lesbian items construct female sexuality and gender ideology in contemporary Nigerian novels? And that's a word we're going to be doing. <clears throat> For our theoretical anchor, we've anchored this study on critical discourse analysis. And due to the eclectic nature of CDA, CDA allows that you also bring in um, theories that can help you in interpreting discourses. That's why we also we also be using Lakoff's dominance theory and Butler's gender performance theory and other women's situation model. These theories have something in common. That is, they argue for a situation where lesbian items can be contextualized. And from there, you can read meanings to whatever you are doing. Now, for our data, we focused on 70 gender related lesbian items. I didn't say from the start that this study, is, this paper is taken from a postdoctoral research that I am currently doing and that's what brought me to South Africa in the first place and to roads in particular. So we, uh, we've we used some of the data that we've collected so far from the six books that we're using and the two books again under the dollar trees and working with shadows they deal with a tiny issue in the Nigerian society. Nigerian society is one that does not tolerate homosexuality in any form. 
of these two books, they deal with homosexuality alongside other issues. So that's why <coughs> we've selected them. Now, we've identified two broad gender ideologies. The first one is patriarchy and feminism. But then we have been able to bring out specific ideologies under the different broad ideologies. And first, I'll look at some ideologies that <laughs> relate to feminism in some way. The first one is that man, the man is ineffectual. In these two novels, we have instances where the novelist try to discredit the man that patriarchy has put in a position to dominate the woman. Now, male ineffectuality implicates the incapability of men in producing a desired and satisfactory outcome on some patriarchal practices. It's expected, according to patriarchy, that a woman should provide protection. A man should provide protection for a woman. A man should provide for her. That's what patriarchy detects indirectly when he tries to say man is stronger than a woman. In a way, the stronger sex, the gender, should be the one that provides uh, and uh, provides protection for the weaker gender. But then, from the excerpt that we have here, says, let me tell you a bit about why I never married Osita's father. He didn't know what he wanted, and he let his family and friends dictate his life. I never knew I was pregnant when I left him, and that was the whole point. I was not going to trap him with a baby, and because I knew being preg pregnant is not a good enough reason to get married. I'm responsible for my happiness, not some man. This is taken from walking with shadows. And now, two lesbian items of interest to us here. On the first instance, we have the, the, the verb phrase, they didn't know, as well as the clause, that's the noun clause, what he wanted. These are context bound expressions that imply frailty, demands the man's weakness explains why perhaps he doesn't know the woman <coughs> who she has been, sleep, he has been sleeping with is pregnant for him. And also, in the process, abdicates his patriarchal responsibilities. Further, dismissing patriarchy and his claim of the man's superiority, Ioma declares that she is responsible for her happiness. And for her to be happy, she doesn't have to depend on any man. So this goes to show that for a woman to be happy, the woman does not depend on any man in the society. Now, another excerpt that can be used to illustrate this from what we found so far is what we have in Under the Dada Trees, where the excerpt reads, that night I took out a notebook and as Ugochi rambled on about boys, I wrote to Amina in it, just a pledge of a note. Nothing that I actually intended to give to Amina. Not in that moment, at least. It was simply for purposes of courtesy. I wrote, all the things the boy will do, I promise to do better. In all the ways he can love you, I promise to love you better. Now, Ijeoma, who is the main character in Under the Dollar Trees, and Amina, they are partners. They are lesbians. And here, while in a hostel, one of her roommates, Ugochi, talks about the boys that she's dating. And Amina makes the point, uh, Ijeoma makes the point very clear that whatever a guy would do, a boy would do, as your lover, I promise to do better, and I promise to love you better. So this is also an indictment on patriarchy and heteronormativity. When we pay attention to the comparative adjective, they're better, when we interpret it in relation to the code test, that is the surrounding words, there we see that what Apparenta is trying to do there is to tell us that it's possible for people who belong to the same gender to actually love and love better than what patriarchy and heteronormativity detects or expects from them. Then another ideology that we've identified is that the woman is assertive 
this is not what patriarchy wants them to be. But then if you look at how uh, Ada intelligently uses words here, then we see how she's been assertive. So his lips curved into a flirtatious mind. They were a little chapped, but his lips <coughs> beneath were flawlessly aligned. Two rows of perfect little white squares. He said, Omalicha, won't you agree that every man needs a wife? I laughed with discomfort, more a sneaker than a regular laugh. I suppose some women would also do well to have a husband. Now we focus attention on the word every and some there. Now patriarchy and heteronormativity expect that every man in society must have a wife and every woman must have a husband. But Hijama is trying to say that that does not have to apply to everybody. That could apply to some people. If I'm not comfortable with a man, then why should I get married to a man? If I'm more comfortable with a woman, then I should be allowed to get married to a woman. So she's being assertive and trying to project a stance. Then, patriarchy, we have instances of this ideology too, where the woman is still being seen as commodity, something that can be bought and be sold. And the women folk themselves, in some cases, have been made to believe because of the insidious power of patriarchy that they also subscribe to patriarchy unconsciously. Yeah, this, this is a woman talking. A fellow woman actor, have you managed to remain married to this man? Then simple, Kawa said, as long as my husband provides me with all the comfort I deserve without complaint or compromise, then he can do whatever. So the woman, in essence, sells herself. And this other one, except five, when uh, Ijeoma seems not to be in the mood to sleep with her husband, and the husband brings out money, so tell me how much you want. How much does it cost to get to do it tonight? So she, he has reduced the woman to a commodity that can be bought and sold. Someone that he's married to, and he offers the woman money to sleep with her because of the time constraint. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panel. And um, I welcome comments and questions. And thank you. If I have one, two, I thought, is your hand? OK, two so far. So where's Johnny? Hi there. I enjoyed the panel very, very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, to the second speaker, I have a question about, which is a historical literary question. I'm sorry? So, a historical literary question yes. about um, things that are, or notions that are attached to the short story. Mm -hmm. So, long before um, the discussion of the short story as a kind of appropriate or some kind of special place mm -hmm. for gay writing, which I'm you know, aware of. Um, in the 1970s in South Africa, we have this notion, the 60s and 70s, that the short story is the perfect place mm -hmm. for um, black South African anti-apartheid mm -hmm. protest writing. And I'm just wondering in a kind of historical context, you know, what, what what it is about the short story that allows us to make these kind of claims and if, you know, what is it about the form that um, other than, you know, what is it about the genre of it that where we make these claims, it, I mean, there is always been the argument, well, it's just the most, you know, economic form because it's a short story, but I, I don't kind of buy that because yeah. some of them are as carefully crafted as, you know, you know what the, I'm asking. <laughs> right? Okay, and then for... Um, for our speaker on um, your work in um, on with women, I just have a, a genuine question as somebody who's a literary scholar and an AIDS researcher. So when we were working on AIDS in this country going back, in, in particular I was working with um, women in 1999, it's really interesting that in prevention discourses, the ignored populations were the gay populations, right? So 
gay men sort of sort of had it a little bit easier because they knew that the condom worked, but getting hold of dental dams for women and things was really difficult. And even for, for heterosexual women, getting hold of a female condom, which would have given more power, at some point the government decided to go with male condoms and not female condoms. So I'm wondering whether there isn't some kind of nuancing that's required in discussing who get, you know, Certainly, I think those populations were exoticized, but in terms of actual practical medical discourse, uh, medical and practical discourse around sexuality, they were actually under-discussed populations. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes. Thank you very much for your beautiful presentation. Um, this comment is going to the third speaker when she raised issues that Oyewumi raised and said that... Um, the Yoruba society, or, or I don't know, the society that is not constructed in uh, via gender gender roles. I, I did not understand what you were trying to say about um, Oyewumi's um, uh, Oye point when she talked about the Yoruba society and it's not structured, you know, with gender roles. And I want you to please contest that saying and not accept it. Every author has a way of writing whatever he or she wants to write. But if you listen to the very last speaker here, who spoke? The Nigerian society is a purely patriarchal society. Roland raised the same thing, purely patriarchal society. Evelyn in her presentation raised the same thing. He raised, we are like, and we don't know ourselves. And look at what the, 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 the last speaker just said, that a woman is seen as a commodity. I made an analysis of the contrastive analysis of, of uh, for a woman in Yoruba culture. You have like 25 proverb who de proverbs that describe women as com as agents of evil, um, objects, and all that. So where one author comes from, you know, her own style of saying that it's this is how it is. I want you to contest it, and I want you to look at the background of the author. Or you won't care, or you will meet from the or your entire, and she's from a kinship lineage. I don't know if I'm making sense. She's not like a normal Yoruba woman, you know, out there who is struggling. She's a child of a king. Do you expect that? And then some authors write based on their background. Do you expect a woman who had it rosy, who stays in the palace, and who now lives in America to give you the, the I don't know if you, you know, to give you what goes on? Why? At least for this conference, we have four, five of us who have criticized patriarchy in our society. So I'm only calling your attention to it so that you can find a way. He, he gave, he gave um, a book here, Dogo 2014, and every other person in this conference who has raised up patriarchy to put it side by side and then come up with something. And that's just a bit of contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this round? Thank you. Yes. Thanks so much for the panel. Uh, my question is for Chiniko. Um, You said that the elderly women that you've been doing focus groups with um, are under social pressure because they're seen as not supposed to be sexual. And I wanted to know from doing the focus groups, do you find that that cultural expectation to not be sexual interferes with like how they engage with you? Uh, were they ashamed of their sexuality, or was it like something they were really comfortable speaking about? Thank you. So I think that might constitute a first round. Yes, please. Uh, am I correct? Yes, go. Um, from what I can remember, you were sort of asking me, you know, people sort of just say, oh, it's just because it's a more urgent form of writing, it, it gets to the point quicker. So. What I, I actually wanted to elaborate more on Murray's research because it's actually really um, it was <laughs> published like three weeks ago, yeah. <laughs> and it's a really fascinating article because she sort of implies that this short story space has always allowed for experimentation with literary and narrative form. For example, with um, watering the imagination, it's two pages long. It's, it's about paragraph, but there's so much that is condensed into that small little paragraph. And she also mentions some other short stories that are more poetic in form. For example, they are short stories and they match the length of the short stories, but the way that the lines are delivered are single lines. And so 
I think I'm answering your question. You I'm not are, quite really, sure. Yeah. Well, I'm it's, it's, yeah. it's just, it's, it's less constrictive than, or at least what Murray argues, it's less constrictive than a novel, for example, where you are expected to deliver a narrative and it's... You, the spatiality of it as well, I think, lead, lends itself more to this experimental playfulness. It's quite postmodern in its playfulness, I would argue. I'm not sure if that answers. Oh, or... it does. And I guess, <laughs> I guess looking for a kind of historical recognition of the fact that mm. this has happened. It's, you know. Yeah. And it, it, I'm sorry. I just want to like further elaborate. Like for example, during the struggle, like it was the place where black writers would go because it is this playful realm. Mm. And so now we have queer writers who are playing with these writings because it has always been the space where the writer can play. Okay. I yes. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. To answer your question, I. I. Well, I work for the HSRC, uh, Human Rights. Yeah, that. Um, I don't feel um, queer individuals have been ignored in literature. I think mainly their sexuality has been viewed as diseased and less about the pleasure. I mean, you will remember that HIV was viewed as a gay man's disease. I mean, it came with a white gay man and all of that. So I feel now it's become more pronounced and <coughs> we see more people getting infected with HIV and it's assumed it comes from those individuals that are not viewed as normal <laughs> because their sex is not normal as compared to the heterosexuals. And also in our research um, we found that um, white people were sort of in the periphery, it's mostly the black people that are infected with HIV. That That's their problem. I mean, when we did our household survey, we would go to different houses that uh, are sampled in the study, and the white people would chase us out of their houses and say, no, that's a black man's disease. We don't have HIV here. Go interview your black people. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'm answering you there, but... Mm. Yeah, it's a tough one. Can we? And then in terms of uh, the gender roles and what I was trying to say uh, about Oyomi's argument, um, there's been a lot of people, uh, a lot of scholars that have sort of troubled her interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't have time to elaborate on those scholars, but I think for me, I see it as patriarchy and gender was not as pronounced in pre-colonial um, Africa as it is now. I mean, an example is in my family, um, my aunt, because she's the eldest one, she's the one who's in the forefront who negotiates Lobola for us. So it's not the men in the family. So my dad is younger than her and he's not involved there because he's a man, so he needs to handle the Lobola or any of that. And again, another example that I'm thinking of is in uh, Isizulu. There is no he, she, no. him, or it's in Kosazana, Kosigazi. Women are seen as powerful, they are queens, and yeah, I, I don't think I'll answer you, but yeah, that's how I interpret it. Okay, I was so. going to say that I knew you were seeing it from the South African perspective. And I was going to take you back to the West African perspective where Oyerunke Oye, Oye, Oye comes from. Mm -hmm. And what I was trying to say was that that's what happens here. But over there, where she comes from, she's from West Africa. It's, it's, it's the opposite. Women have voices. I mean, Kalawale, womanism and African consciousness made it clear. The, uh, the, the Yoruba woman is expected to be seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. When your voice is heard, you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are seen as someone who is given a, a bad smell. And I have a proverb who describe, that describes anywhere where a woman talks. It means uh, uh, the tree. Arire is a strong plant uh, where a woman stands up to talk. She stinks. Mm. I'm not the one who said it. Mm. I, got, I just gave you the name of the author who gave that proverb. My Yoruba is not very good, but all these books are there. So what we're trying to call your attention to is that sometimes some of this um, sayings or some of these um, writings can be contested by those of us, you know what I mean, who are coming from that part of Africa to, to, to explain that, look, there is real patriarchy. 
If you look at about, like I said, 20 proverbs to describe a woman as negative, and you have like five with Sorry. scientific context. So that's what I'm trying to say that you should, um, you know, <laughs> look at other scholars and see what they have to say. I that's think that you also make a very valuable point about understanding that we can't just say Africa. Mm -hmm. and, and take here, take here, take here and just put them all together but they they are context uh, bound yeah, and yeah. temporarily bound so it's a very very necessary point thank you um, any other questions for uh, a second round before we go to tea oh sorry can I just answer her oh forgive me yes I knew that there was <laughs> forgive me yes go ahead. Um, I think because I worked with some of the elderly women in my master's um, project um, most of them were open to talking about it but first it was a bit uncomfortable especially because I in the focus group we had mixed both the younger women and the older women and for them it was taboo to discuss sex around children but from the positive feedback they received from the women who were in the master's um, research it was positive and I found that women actually love talking about sex. I mean, the elderly women dominated um, the discussion. I mean, they would talk about their uh, love lives and what they get up to, but obviously they would be guarded. I mean, one of them would say, okay, switch it off. We don't want your professor to hear this. We don't want to embarrass you. We want to be proper goggles and yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that would make a fascinating <laughs> book in itself. <laughs> um, any further comments or questions for the panel? I see um, Tina and Grace. Thank you. Um, I would also like to uh, express my appreciation for the panel. I really enjoyed it. And my question is for Jenny. Um, I wondered if you could elaborate a bit on the work that the term ordinary does um, as you've been using it um, in relation to the erotic. Just say a little bit more about that. I was very intrigued by that. Thank you. Yes, I love that rediscovery of the ordinary erotic. That's <laughs> yes. a brilliant juxtaposition. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I, 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 I constantly have hope your presentation to me, but I'm wondering about the age of you, the women you're working with, because so because all the elderly go go the very fluid so I wondered what, what that and, and I want to tie that then to the question of age and, and in a way physiological changes to women's bodies and how that then impacts on the in a way the registers of the erotic available to biologically older women and whether this can, comes up in your work so I just I was curious about the age and uh, that element and then uh, uh, Olorotimi, I wondered about um, your, in a way, since you ran out of time, and we seem to have a bit of time, uh, would, you, would you tell us a bit more about the kinds of conclusions you arrive at? And what I noticed is your, your analysis tended to be very linguistic, so you seem to be zooming in on words and then extrapolating them to, to larger discourses. And I was just curious about what, what are the conclusions you're trying to <coughs> and how do these texts work as narrative? Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Would you like to start, Jenny? Um, um, <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that question um, precisely. Um, I suppose I was interested in the term ordinary because it's in a way has so many different meanings. So, I mean, obviously Nabela uses it very specifically um, and is more than just like the mundane, like he uses it in sort of political, and I want to draw on that, as well as then drawing on the other connotations of the mundane. Um, so in a way, bringing the erotic back to like something that happens to everyone and is part of, of people's lives and um, when I think in some ways it's like if you look at Lord for example the idea that it's been kind of um, in women's lives particularly like uh, there's been an alienation um, so I suppose it was that I'm not sure if that really answers the question <laughs> Um, the ages were between 18 and 34 and I also grappled with the older elderly but that was my editor but um, the elderly were between uh, 70 and 84 and the older ones were in their mid uh, 50s and late 40s 
Um, for them, I don't. Well, the changes in their body were not discussed in that much detail. But what I gathered from them, they would say, "No, Tiniko, you young women are lazy. Tina, we know how to move a man because we don't have high blood and diabetes, so we're still strong. We can move them. You are the lazy ones. So, it, it, yeah, the changes in their bodies were not factored in any way." <laughs> Okay, to answer your question, you asked why I focused on lazy coin terms. Yeah, probably from my background as a critical discourse analyst, we yeah, usually pay attention to words, clauses, and phrases, and how we can relate them to the larger meaning text. So that's why I did that. And one thing I observed from um, the two novels that I used that while there have been silences on um, discourses on homosexuality and mm -hmm. the form of sexuality, we're beginning to have um, contemporary novelists that are coming up to challenge that. Because like it has been established here that already the argument has been that homosexuality is an African. But then we now have main characters that are African that are portrayed as homosexuals. So now, how do they advance their cause? How are they seen and how do they see themselves? In a way, this could be a link to the struggle that feminism is trying to, to achieve, that's that of liberation and, and resistance to, and that's what plays out in some of those things we saw there. We saw some of those characters trying to resist the, the patriarchic tendencies and traits that are being imposed, that have been imposed on them. Thank you very much. I uh, please join me in thanking our panel um, for this. <laughs> Good luck with the review. <laughs> and now we will have tea, and then the last session, the climactic session.